Hey guys, what's going on? So I have a really cool interview here for you guys. Here I have David Dole from the Rational National. He actually has over 30,000 subscribers and he is growing quite rapidly. And he's another progressive outlet on here. How's it going, David? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well as well, man. So, you know, you're one of the channels that's really on the rise right now as well. And you're starting to kind of get to the point where you have an audience that's similar to the bigger channels. Um, mm -hmm. I was just curious, what made you decide to start a political channel in the first place? Um, so I guess it's a, it's a combination of things. So my background is actually in terms of, uh, education is in e-commerce and in television production. So out of, out of school, after going uh, to school for, for video production, I began working at a TV station working in news. And so I was doing video editing and, uh, while I enjoyed it, like I enjoyed the work, it was very repetitive and just staying in the same task uh, of just editing kind of got boring to me. Um, cause I, I, I enjoyed, you know, controlling all aspects of video production behind the camera, in front of the camera, um, editing all that stuff. So I, I kind of did like a, a big shift in my career. I worked in marketing for a bit realized that was soul sucking uh, and I had to get out of that somehow. And that was also around the time where I, I started to become more engaged in politics. And I actually ran as a, a Green Party MP candidate in, in Canada um, in 2015. And uh, that is sort of what lit the fire under me. I mean, for, for a while I had been into politics, but in following politics, but really running is what made me realize I want to talk about this more. I want to actually push uh, progressive policy out there. So I started my channel just a few months after um, that election and uh, put out videos here and there. Uh, wasn't really too consistent with it. I wasn't really sure where it was going to go. But uh, I around that time, I, I didn't have a job. I, I, I'd lost my job. So... I really only had the YouTube channel. So I started putting more and more videos out. And eventually, really, it was April of last year, after I, I had come back from uh, California for a, a short trip just, just to uh, be out there. Actually, I was out there. I checked out a, a live Jimmy Dore show, which was awesome. Oh, wow. um, that sort of relit me to get back into doing this more consistently. So I put out like a, a video maybe a week after that, and it blew up. And it was on uh, the Democratic Party and Bernie Sanders and Tom Perez. And actually, it's funny because that video now, YouTube pulled it down for some reason. Oh, um, really? But it, it, yes, it's my only video that was pulled down. Why but was it it's funny. Down? Uh, I forget what the reasoning was. Uh, oh, it was copyright issues, oh. which is so weird because it was an MSNBC clip. And I use MSNBC clips all the time. But it, it was the only one. And it was pulled down maybe six months later. Like this is way after that video had been up wow. and they pulled it down. So I, I don't know. But that was the video that sort of uh, blew up and got me to, to really get back into it and start doing it on a more regular basis. So then I started to put out videos every day of the week. And then they, some of them uh, began to caught fire. I had a Nina Turner video that hit like 500,000 views. I was like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know yeah. why this video is so popular. <laughs> but but uh, after all that happened, I'm like, okay, this is, I'm good. I'm going to keep doing this. And hopefully it'll keep growing, and, and it has. So, yeah. And uh, before you started your channel, or maybe even like in the, relatively in the beginning, were there any other, you know, new media programs on YouTube or online that you kind of looked at and kind of uh, was your inf influence your show in any way? Yeah. Um, I got to say the Young Turks was probably my biggest influence. I had been watching their videos for quite a while. Uh maybe since 20, 2012, 2013. And um, the more I got into that, the, that was sort of the, 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 uh, the unveiling of, of what's actually happening behind the scenes in politics. Because before that, I had really just been following, you know, the usual, the, the usual cable news uh, stations and, and just the standard uh, publications. But then TYT sort of, you know, criticized politics in a way and the media in a way that showed me, oh, yeah, MSNBC isn't really criticizing Obama. And he has done all these things. So 
that was sort of the awakening where it's like, oh, there actually are some rational people out here talking about reality. And not just talking about reality, but actually they have – there's an agenda. And and they're open and honest about it. It's it's progressive policy. They want to push progressive policy out there. And I'm on board with that in terms of, uh, you know, people having uh, health care and, and education. So that spoke to me. And that combined with uh, my run, uh, my short run uh, as a political candidate and the the rise of Bernie Sanders that around that time began to start in late 2015. It was kind of the culmination of all these things that really lit the fire under my belly to get to get uh to get into this and and really push videos out there and you you mentioned some criticism of corporate media for being obviously very corporate and not really having real criticisms did that kind of was that part of the reason why you decided to start making videos was because you wanted to kind of fill that void and and really fill this void of actual criticisms from the left instead of just kind of you know manufactured stuff that's very weak yeah, it, it was definitely that was definitely a big part of it because the there's this this fake neutrality, right. or actually, I mean, it's real neutrality, but it's it's fake objectivity. They pretend that they're being objective, <clears throat> but in reality, they're being neutral. They're just be they're just picking the the middle. They're like, well, uh, conservatives say climate change isn't real. Liberals say climate change is real. I don't know. I'm in the middle. I just, let's have a discussion. But the objective fact is that climate change is real, and that we need to do something about it. So the media has this position where they they don't they aren't objective to the facts. They're neutral to the politics. And that doesn't speak to what people need done in their lives. I mean, that doesn't help somebody who who uh, can't afford to go to college. That that doesn't help them to go to college. They need help or or someone that needs health care. Ha- having a discussion on well, maybe universal health care is good, but maybe it's bad. That doesn't help anybody. Like the objective fact is that look around the world where universal health care has been implemented, nobody goes back. That, I mean, when you get health care, you keep it. So to me, that shows you that there is now a proven method of doing things. And when you see that, um, whether it's in other countries or, or, or wherever it is, that should alert both the media and and uh, policymakers to, oh, look, we sh- check out Sweden, see what they're doing. But that isn't the discussion. The discussion, especially in the U.S. because of the because of money in politics, it's really about who, which whose donor has more money. Like that's that's what the discussion gets <laughs> down. To. And it and a lot of times it's you know, the same donors on both sides. Right. So getting out there and really speaking truth to uh, truth to power and just speaking reality in terms of policy and in terms of what these, uh, who actually controls these politicians, to me, that really spoke to me because I felt like that message needed to get out there. And there are a lot of people who are just misinformed and it's not, it's not their fault. It's because the media has misinformed them. So the more of uh, people like me and you are out there, the, the better chance there is for people to be uh, informed and, and get deprogrammed from the programming that the mainstream media has given them. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you're, when you started out, and even to this day, of course, you talked a lot about Bernie Sanders because uh, uh, your channel was up during the primary, right? So yep. I was just curious as to how much Bernie Sanders' campaign kind of galvanized either your support for him or just, you know, the policy positions that he pushed and your whole channel basically in general. Yeah, uh, massively. So if, if you go to my channel... Bernie's face is literally in the header, so right, right. And, and his and and at the at the end of my videos. So he, to me, like a, uh, it's important to not get it too twisted. So uh, if Bernie does something wrong, I'm going to criticize him. But right. to me, Bernie is a symbol of somebody who has been principled in his progressive positions, and that's why I use him on my channel because. To me, the, the, he's the ultimate symbol of somebody that has a record of 40 years fighting on these issues. Right. And you know he's genuine about the issues that he's fighting for. He's not fake. So having him out there as a, a sort of the symbol for my channel, for me, is important. And it, uh, it helped to grow the channel as well. So a lot of my early videos was really about getting hyped up about Bernie Sanders. And right. because the media didn't didn't have that... It wasn't filling that void. There was so much excitement about Bernie online, 
But when you watch television, they were talking about, well, Hillary's going to win and uh, Donald Trump is out there being crazy. But how about Bernie? I mean, Bernie's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> but the media was not focused on that. And for one reason or another, I mean, a big part of that is the the money that's behind these massive networks that don't want to see somebody like Bernie in there to change the system up. But that's why it's so important that online media exploded during that uh, during Bernie's run, because they really did. I mean, uh, the Young Turks and, and Kyle Kalinske Humanist Report, uh, all these channels came out and were like, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders is the guy. So, yeah, it's a, for me, he's a real symbol of progressive policy. So let's just kind of briefly go back to the 2016 primary. You know, with the whole thing of Bernie Sanders, of course, being cheated out of a fair primary, I just kind of wanted to know your thoughts on what happened and the because the debate still rages on to this day about that primary and what to do now. You know, what do you think happened and what can we do to prevent that from happening in the future? And just in general, I mean, I'd like to hear your thoughts about Hillary Clinton's campaign in general. Okay. So it was Bernie, his loss in the primaries, to me, it was a culmination of things. It was it was the, the failure of the media and the failure... Uh, Almost the failure of the the political process separate from the DNC and then the failure as well of the DNC. So let me try to break that down. So the media, I already kind of broke that that part of it down. They, they just didn't cover him enough. Um, they didn't cover his, his policy enough because a, a lot of what media is, is, is drama, especially in the U.S. There isn't much policy discussion. So if there were actually discussions on the policies that he was proposing and a fair discussion on it, like talking about healthcare and acknowledging the fact that all these other countries have universal healthcare. If there was a discussion like that happening on, you know, MSNBC, CNN on a regular basis, I think it would have made a huge difference, but there wasn't. But the next part of that, the, the, the political process. So while, while elections in the U S are too long in Bernie's case, if the, if the primary was like three months longer, he would have won. Do you think if the do you think if the state order was changed because it first went through the south and he really got obliterated in the yeah, south? Yeah, I think if the yeah. order was different, do you think that would have had like a pretty big effect on it as well? Yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's it's hard to know exactly, but I really think any any number of things could have completely changed the situation. So I think the uh, the primaries um, or the 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 southern states being a, a large focus is a large part of the reason why. He, uh, I mean, he, he started off, I, he started off almost winning a state and then, and then Hillary won, uh, won a bunch of states and then he won a bunch of states later on. So it's, it's one of these things where he was always playing catch up right. and especially when the media, uh, another part, I have to get back to the media. They kept showing the, the super delegates, yeah. the super delegates that, that right. were promised to Hillary, mm -hmm. but she didn't have them yet. Yeah. So for the media to to continue to push this narrative. Well, she's already winning. Look how much she's winning by. But no, the, they hadn't they, they hadn't voted yet. Yeah, that's massively so frustrating because I remember one time being in the car and listening to the AM radio and they were they were saying the lead as the, as her having like a thousand delegate lead, but they were counting yeah. the super delegates in and that just makes it seem so skewed to the average everyday American. So that was very yeah. horrible. It's it, it's so disingenuous. And then on top of all that, the uh the the DNC and just how they operated the the debates Debbie Wasserman Schultz I mean we know the whole story now that we saw the leaked emails we, we know that they were always working against Bernie and even before all that stuff came out we instinctively knew because we we knew they didn't want Bernie Sanders in yeah. he he wasn't part of their club mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't have he didn't use the same consultants that they did right. he didn't he uh, the yeah. the very fact that that he had the potential of winning to them was a threat because right. that would upset their whole money machine, the whole consultant system and, and everything that the Democratic Party has been about promising the carrot, but then really giving in to the right wing. And it's it's what they they've they've always done, or at least for the past 30 years. And it's one of those things where any any number of, of little change in the political process or the DNC or the media could have led to Bernie winning the primary. And I think ultimately 
if he had won the primary, he easily would have defeated Donald Trump because they both spoke to a similar message. But Bernie's was actually genuine and he actually had real solutions. Yeah. And in polls, he was also obliterating Trump as well. Um, yeah. So for 2020, you know, I know that you also covered the story about where Bernie basically got a bunch of his advisors together to ask him and talk about a possible 2020 run. Do you think that he should run in 2020? And if he does, uh, do you think that he'll be able to beat Joe Biden if Joe Biden were to run <laughs> hypothetically? Joe Biden. <laughs> um, I think Bernie's going to run. I, I, I think Bernie's going to run. I, for some reason, I, I have this uneasiness that maybe he won't. And I hate to say it, but maybe it's because of age. Um, okay. Even though, I mean... He's pretty healthy. Ju- yeah, he, he's, he, he's very healthy. But yeah. it's one of those things where it's like... I don't know. It's 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 like he should have already won, right? Like yeah. I feel like he should have already won <laughs> in, yeah, in the la- in the past. So it feels like it's almost catching up now. And okay, now Bernie's gonna win. But I mean, if he runs, he 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 wins absolutely. Um, Joe Biden, who is only a year younger than Bernie, by the way, but I don't think Joe Biden has much of a chance. Uh, I I think what uh, the people that actually have a chance of 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 winning a Democratic primary. And this is if Bernie doesn't run. Um, is uh, Cory Booker possibly, <laughs> uh, Ka- Kamala Harris uh, possibly, yeah. and uh, Kirsten Gillibrand? I think these are three people who are able to speak to the center and are able to fool enough progressives to, to into voting for them. And I don't want to say you know fool as in as in you should you shouldn't vote for them at all if they were the choice. I'm just saying in terms of like them pretending to be a Bernie. Right. They're not. They don't have a 40 year record on these issues. A lot of them now, like Cory Booker and Kirsten Gillibrand, are now saying, oh, I'm going to stop taking corporate PAC yeah, money. Yeah, I was just but about to say that. You took that, it all that the, just yeah. came out. And I guess yeah. it's because she's campaigning now, right? So that's the reason why she's doing that. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's not to say it's not a bad move. So I did a, a, a video on that. Right. It's a good move that, that they are cutting out corporate PAC money. But it still doesn't speak to the other problems with campaign finance, which is a lot of the money they raise is from large donors. So it's a lot of time on the phone calling these wealthy people, talking with these wealthy people, hearing these wealthy people's problems. And that's not to say wealthy people aren't people too. Yeah. But if, if that's the, the majority of your engagement with people is wealthy people either on the phone or at cocktail parties or at fundraisers, then you're going to have a different worldview than if you're somebody like Bernie Sanders, who is goes to union rallies and you know is, is on the, the the picket lines and has a 40 year record of fighting for people. So it's just a different thing. But if Bernie doesn't run, I I would say it's likely between Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, or Kirsten Gillibrand. If Elizabeth uh, Warren, Warren were to run, what would your reaction be, and how would you act? during the election would you be an ardent supporter would you be a supporter because a lot of people are angry that she didn't support bernie sanders and recently she said yeah the the primaries were rigged and then like a second later she said they weren't they weren't rigged yeah. so you know there's a lot of um, kind of you know hoopla going on there yeah so i it if she if she ran and bernie doesn't run yeah i would support her over 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 anybody else because i think warren in her heart, she does want to do the right thing. I think the problem is because she's in the Democratic Party, she has had to almost give in in, in some ways. Right. And she is surrounded by the establishment. I mean, so when you're surrounded by people that are that may have a different worldview than you, you begin to take on their worldview or at least understand their perspective better. But because Elizabeth Warren, uh, in her past, uh, she was more progressive and she even uh, there's a video of her holding Hillary's feet to the fire yeah. on an issue that 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 Hillary went back on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Elizabeth Warren would do the right thing. She just has to surround herself with the right people. Now, in terms of her not supporting Bernie in in the primaries, I think that was a mistake uh, by her right. clearly. Yep. But for sure. But uh, I empathize with her position because she was in the situation where. She likely didn't expect Bernie to do as well as as he did, and she probably thought that Hillary was going to win. And 
the problem with the Hillary machine, and luckily that machine has run out of gas, but at the time, the problem with the Hillary machine was that they would destroy you if you didn't support them. Yeah. So I think Warren was worried that if if she doesn't if she doesn't uh, or if, I think Warren was worried that if she supported Bernie before the primary was over, supported Bernie over Hillary, that if Bernie lost, then there would be no hope for progressive policy. So I really think that Elizabeth Warren did it from an honest place. She thought if she can get in on Hillary's good side, then she could maybe be in her administration and try to push progressive policy on her. Because oh, so you think that's why she did it? Was yeah, because I, she wanted I don't to get into her admin to push progressive policies. Yeah, absolutely. Because okay. Elizabeth that's Warren, uh, yeah, she has a good history. So uh, I have yeah, no reason does. to think she's she's being conniving. So for me, it was all about. Uh, Elizabeth Warren recognizing that Hillary hadn't surrounded herself or has nobody really progressive around her. And Elizabeth Warren could have been that person to push Hillary in a presidency that everyone thought Hillary was going to win. So she's it's it's it was a mistake that Elizabeth Warren made. But hindsight's 2020. And it's it's hard to know what's how things are really going to shake out until they happen. I see. And just really briefly on the 2016 election, um, as we know, Hillary blew it. You know, what do you think the problems were with that campaign, and what are some of those things that we can solve for 2020 for, you know, a Democrat to be in office unless you were wanted to vote third party? Yeah, um, Hillary's mistakes were well. One thing, she was Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I mean that, that was probably <laughs> the biggest mistake. It was. For uh, sure. But even apart from that, so or or because of that, because she was Hillary Clinton, she was trying to appeal to moderate right-wingers, yeah. which mm -hmm. in the world of MSNBC and CNN, they think there's a lot of those people yeah. because they're all moderates. The, their whole world, the people on television, the, those news people on television and politicians, the majority of them are in the center, yeah. but the rest of the country is not. And so they have this worldview that, well, everyone else is like me. Most people are in the center. They're, they're not left or right, they're in the center. No, when you actually look at the policy what people support on policy, people want Medicare for all, the majority of people, everybody, whether you're conservative, liberal, it doesn't matter. The majority of people want Medicare for all. The majority of people want higher taxes on the rich and higher taxes on, on large corporations. So these are issues that media makes you think, oh, so everyone's in the center. Nobody really wants those things. No, people want these things. And the, the only polling that the media looks at is the polling on how people self-identify. So yeah. a lot of people self-identify as conservative. But if you polled them and, or if you asked them, do you want Medicare for all, they would say yes. But they just identify with the conservative spectrum. And that's because uh, of a variety of reasons. Maybe they're, right. they're a farmer and they think farmers are conservative. Like, like whatever it is, that people have certain associations with the word conservative as People have associations with the word liberal. A lot of conservatives just don't want to be looked at as liberals because right. liberal ha has a negative um, a negative meaning for a lot of people. But when you actually look at the policy, most people support progressive policy. So Hillary Clinton's big mistake was not speaking to that and not recognizing that. And, I mean, she picked Tim Kaine as her VP. Yeah. Like, how out of touch Horrible do you have move. to be? So, so stupid. If she had picked Bernie, even though... I'm not sure how much say Bernie would have actually had. It would have been better it, than nothing. She would have won. If yeah. Bernie was her VP, she would have won. Easily. Or it, maybe even Elizabeth Warren. If she had picked Elizabeth Warren, I think she could have won. But she made that mistake. And it's not so much, it's not so much about not campaigning in the right places, though that is part of it. It's not recognizing the anger against the establishment that was in the country. And Hillary Clinton was the embodiment of the establishment. Right. So even if she had addressed those other things, I'm not sure if people would have really trusted her because her entire career has been part of the establishment. Right. So you quickly actually just touched there on how liberal has a negative connotation to some people. There's also this kind of like new, honestly, I want to call it this kind of like, I guess, like ideological battle or war or something where there's a big split between liberals and progressives now. And there's a good, I would say there's a decent amount of progressives who would say that they hate liberals 
And I was wondering what you identify as because a lot of liberals are the, you know, the people who will forever support Hillary Clinton but don't really support Medicare for all and other issues like that. While progressives are people who support Bernie Sanders and they support all the issues, you know, $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, stopping the wars, etc., etc. You know, what would you, would you still describe yourself as a liberal? Because I feel like a lot of progressives would not at this point. No, I'm, well, I, I'm, I'm absolutely a, a, a progressive for sure. Um, but I think a lot of this, this liberal progressive fight is really just Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the vast majority of people aren't having these debates day to day. And if you again, if you ask people on the policy what they support, I think they support the, the the vast majority of policies that progressives support. They just don't recognize that that is uh, identified with the word progressive. But yeah, all these these fights. So David Brock, correct the record, his super PAC, he he manufactures dissent. Yeah. I mean, it, it's he's open about it. They 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 paid for they pay for trolls to. Mm -hmm. To combat any negative, or yeah, to combat any negative uh, messages towards Hillary Clinton or the establishment, and that's what they've done. Uh, I have absolutely, I'm sure, have been in discussions on Twitter with people who were paid trolls, and there are some cases where I've even recognized it just based on their their tweeting behavior. Really? People that tweet, yeah, but people that 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 tweet constantly, and they're they're always tweeting one side. Like every every minute, it's a retweet or it's a tweet. And they only seem to operate nine to five, some of them. <laughs> so it's one of these things where it's like, I don't think you're a real person. And um, I don't know. The, 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 I mean, a lot of these trolls have been caught, especially on uh, on the right. Mm -hmm. There are people like there's a lot of right wing trolls that had used uh, uh, stock images. So like a stock oh. images of a guy wearing a white T-shirt. And then there's a Photoshop where they put like Trump on that T-shirt. And oh, the, wow. so <laughs> that's been that's that's been uh, more easily i guess uh, catchable on the right wing but it happens on all sides and they create they try and create these divisions whether it's it's correct the record doing it whether it's the right wing doing it whether even it's, it's even russia doing it i mean there's definitely manufactured dissent from from everywhere it's just a matter of recognizing that twitter isn't the real world and that if you just get down to it and have a discussion with somebody and talk about policy whether it's the minimum wage or whether it's healthcare, whether it's education the wars whatever it is if you talk with people and, and you give them the perspective that you have that you've been educated on mm -hmm. then most people are going to turn to progressive policy because it's just the rational choice right so you know talking about this liberal progressive kind of divide uh you actually called into the sam cedar show the majority report <laughs> And, you know, yeah, I watched yeah. the I watched the whole video that they put out and, you know, this whole kind of Sam Cedar, Jimmy Dore thing is it's literally still going on to this day. And I know that Sam has just posted videos yesterday, maybe even today, going after Jimmy Dore. So, you know, this is something that probably isn't going to stop anytime soon. And, no. you know, I watched that video and it seemed to be like almost anything you said, he would just kind of like yell or say something. And I, yeah. <laughs> I was just hoping you could kind of elaborate on what the hell happened there because it didn't seem good. No. So I had called with the most positive of intentions, as I normally I'm Canadian. I'm a positive guy. <laughs> so I called in uh, thinking that, oh, if I just talk if I just talk to Sam and I explain to him that uh, Jimmy has an important place in this in this dialogue because he speaks to a lot of people who are angry and. Jimmy breaks down uh, neoliberal policy really well, and, and he, he brings on progressive candidates. Mm -hmm. he, he talks about unions. I mean, Jimmy, if you actually watch his videos and don't do with some and don't do what some people do and just you know cherry pick certain things you don't like, if you actually check out Jimmy's channel, he does incredible progressive work. Right. But um, Sam didn't want to hear it. So, what, what was like so it, what I couldn't even really get to understand what the real meat of the disagreement he was even arguing was what was like the meat of the disagreement there because I don't I really feel like so, he just went on like a tangent and just started saying some random stuff I was kind of yeah, so, uh, I don't I don't really completely understand what their disagreement is uh, I, I think part of it I guess is so a couple years ago I guess Sam Cedar had uh, Jimmy Dore on yeah. his channel as a guest and they had a discussion yeah. And um, if you watch that discussion, 
you so, so what I took from it is I didn't think Sam was being all that kind to to Jimmy and what wh whether or not uh, whoever you dis whoever you agree with or disagree with in that discussion just in terms of the actual you know demeanor uh, of the discussion Jimmy was trying to find some common ground and Sam kept shooting him down and I think Jimmy was turned off by that and because of that uh, I guess they had a previous agreement that that Jimmy would have Sam Cedar on his show, and then after that discussion, he didn't want to didn't want to have him on. And you can't really blame the guy. I mean, if if I'm talked down like that, and it it's it's not it's not productive to if, if you want to educate people. This is what I try to do on my channel. I try to take the perspective of everybody. Like if mm -hmm. if you're a Trump supporter, I don't want to talk shit about you because I can understand how you were you were tricked into voting for Trump. If you're a Hillary supporter, I can understand how you were tricked into voting for Hillary. So there are these positions where it I, and I mean, voting for Hillary in terms of voting for Hillary in the primaries over Bernie. If you voted for Hillary in the general election, I don't care. I mean, good. Like it, it doesn't to me, that doesn't matter. I okay, think people so, should vote. So let's, I think people should vote how they want to vote. Right. So so my kind of uh, understanding, like how I would break it down, forget Jimmy Dore, Sam Cedar, the two names. It seems to me that. Jimmy Dore was kind of a Bernie or bust, and then Sam was someone who said, I don't know if Sam supported strategic voting or if he supported just full-on vote for Hillary, but either way, it's pretty similar. Um, you know, he basically Sam says, you know, uh, if Trump gets in office, we get m possibly multiple su Supreme Court justices who are going to stay on there for literally decades, and that's going to change a lot of rulings. And other stuff, you know, that he's worse on social policies and environmental policy and other stuff as well. Um, but Jimmy says that it would reunite the left and things like that. So where would you say you stand on the Bernie or Bust movement? And, you know, I guess from there, what, who do you kind of agree with more? Maybe this is sort of, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, to me, it's it's a personal choice. So... If I were voting, if I were voting, it would depend on what state I'm in. So if I was in New York, I would have voted for Jill Stein. If I was in California, I would have voted for Jill Stein. So strategic voting then. Yeah. And what's funny is that's also what Jimmy talked about. So I, I remember Jimmy was on a panel on TYT and he's like, I'm voting for Jill Stein. I'm in California. You know, Hillary's going to win this state anyways. So... To me, he, I mean, Jimmy was never telling people not to vote for Hillary Clinton. He was simply selling the side of, look, if the Green Party get to 5%, then they have a little more say in the next election. So that is the, the perspective, or yeah, that's the perspective that he was trying to push. It's not to say don't vote for Hillary. It's just like, this is why I'm voting for Jill Stein. Mm -hmm. So it's, the, the whole discussion is sort of, it's weird to me because... People can vote who they want to vote for. So to give you some perspective, in Canada, we have three main parties. If in the last election uh, you voted for the NDP, which came in third, no one's going to ridicule, uh, ridicule, ridicule you for, for not voting for the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, 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 it's this weird thing where... Nobody's getting angry at anybody else for their vote. If you want to vote liberal, vote liberal. If you want to vote NDP, vote NDP. If you want to vote conservative, vote conservative, though I think you're wrong. But <laughs> there's there's reasons to vote for any of these parties. Nobody gets angry at each other for voting the wrong way. Even in – so while the liberals won the last election, before that, the NDP had a big wave and I think it was 2011 – I don't remember anybody getting angry at liberal voters for not voting for the NDP because if they had more, uh, if they had won more ridings, they could have won that that election. But I, there was no discussion about people being angry at, at at liberal voters. So it's it's this discussion that doesn't it seems isolated to the U.S. Right, and maybe so, it's because so it's a two party system. But uh, yeah, possibly yeah. Uh, so with all that said, I mean, what do you really make with with this just massive feud? Because again. It's been going on like over a year now, and there's no end in sight. I mean, I guess I think ultimately, I don't think it matters. Uh, so I watch both Sam Cedar's show 
and Michael Brooks show. Uh, both are great shows. They do great things. Yeah, I, I watch Jimmy's show. Fantastic show. He does great yeah. things. I think there's room for everybody. There, and there's crossover. There's some, there's some crossover in the audience and some not crossover. So to me, everybody has a place. Everybody has their own audience. And it doesn't make sense to get angry at somebody else who agrees with you on all the policy. Yeah. Because ultimately, that's the goal. Jimmy Dore and Sam Cedar agree universally on actual policy. Mm -hmm. But the fight seems to be over strategy. And to call it a fight is kind of disingenuous. It's not really a fight. It's it's Sam Cedar, you know, putting videos out against uh, Jimmy Dore. I see what it's you not, mean. Jimmy yeah. is not engaging in this. And I think yeah. that's a smart thing to do. Because I don't think it makes sense to turn people off who enjoy watching both shows. It, I don't see the point of it. Because both serve a purpose. And... I learned things from both of them. So Sam doesn't have on progressive candidates. Jimmy does. So, but uh, Sam has on a lot of authors. Actually, so, so does Jimmy. But, <laughs> but there is this. They both serve a purpose, and they're both good in their own way. So to try and take either one down to me doesn't make sense. I, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I want to push anyone out there who is maybe a Jimmy Dore supporter or Jimmy Dore hater or a Sam supporter or Sam hater. Check out the other show. Actually go to the other channel. Don't listen to a single person's opinion of somebody else until you actually go and check out their stuff. Because otherwise you're not getting uh, a clear picture on what they're about. Okay, so you also recently made um, a video about Dave Rubin. Now, you were a fan of Dave Rubin, as you said, uh, for a while. But, you know, he made this whole classical liberal jump. Um mm -hmm. What do you kind of make of his change? And also, you know, you talked about how he's like kind of this kind of fake free speech, you know, advocate or absolutist. You know, what do you make of his change to classical liberalism? Um, just my personal opinion, I think it was completely for money. Mm. Uh, he left the Young Turks supposedly because he wasn't being paid enough money. I don't know if that's true, but I heard that from a, a number of people. Um, but I mean, even if that's not true, he hasn't really, I don't know why he, he's, he's done what he's done. I mean, there's no other rational explanation because for years he was, he appeared to be a progressive person yeah. <laughs> on the, on the policy. But, but sometimes, I mean, if you're living in California, it's expensive to live in California and <laughs> yes, it is <laughs> and you need some money and you're not getting the money you want from where you're working and you see an opportunity to move out. And look, when Dave Rubin first left TYT, there wasn't there was no drama about it. Yeah, there was. it was just like, oh, they had this amical split, like whatever. He, he's doing his own thing. He started his own show. I think he even had Jimmy Dore on his on his new yeah, uh, independent did. show. Yeah, yeah he did. so it was just and then he just this, he made this eventual turn to the right and then he started hanging out with like ben shapiro yeah and i think he was just on greg gutfeld who uh greg greg gutfeld's show who was a, a oh. former fox news anchor yeah, so it's just this, yeah it's and you know if you want to do all that then whatever but but don't be so it's so disingenuous because right. he tries to be this free speech guy but I laid down in my video, I mean, the, the biggest one for me, he didn't cover Chelsea Manning getting kicked out of Harvard as a visiting fellow. And that was while he was giving a talk. Like the same day that story came out, he had a, a talk scheduled at Harvard. And maybe that's the reason he didn't want to say anything about it. He didn't want to upset Harvard. But to not cover that, you really are ignoring uh, issue or free speech issues when it comes to one political perspective, which he claims to not do, or he claims to not be a good thing to do. Right. So, I don't know. It's 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 sad in some way because here's a guy who who could have been a, a strong voice in the progressive movement once was in, in in many ways, and made this turn for whatever his reason was. I don't know, but it's uh it's. The, the whole point of that video wasn't really to, to take Dave Rubin down. It was to just educate people. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if you're a Dave Rubin viewer, I just want you to, to understand that you may not actually be on his side politically. 
he he acts like he's a free speech guy and a neutral guy but in reality he's not and if he was just out there and and said look i'm a right wing guy i believe in right wing policy and and that was his thing then cool do whatever you want but don't pretend to be neutral that's my problem you don't pretend to be something you are not yeah so when it, I, I, do you, have you seen the david packman interview with dave rubin yeah i did yeah so you know that that really kind of showed me how Dave doesn't really know all that much about policy or what he ascribes himself to, which is classical liberalism. Um, yeah. You know, if you saw that, there were things where he says he supports single-payer health care, and then, you know, <clears throat> Pacman says, you know, well, that's completely opposed to classical liberalism because <clears throat> you're bringing the government into it. And yeah. then he describes that he supports Obamacare, not actually single-payer. So... It's kind of all over the place, so I kind of I kind of see what you mean on that. This is uh, why I think it comes from a disingenuous position yeah. because he can't properly explain it. So, because right. because I think in his heart he does believe in single payer health care, yeah. and he does believe in you know equal rights and equal protections, and he is getting paid to not do that. At least that's my feeling. I don't have the proof on that. That's just my subjective opinion on on how I view Dave Rubin. Now, you, you also mentioned Ben Shapiro. Now, um, I don't know how much of him you've seen or you know about him, but, you know, what are your thoughts on Ben Shapiro? He's someone who's kind of revered as kind of the, almost like the messiah for the right at this point. Yeah, I, I'm i not too educated on, on, on Shapiro, except for the random clips that I see that are just, some of them are just ridiculous. So there's a video <laughs> that, that hit Twitter yesterday about him. Oh. Black getting Panther? angry about Black Panther. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, like, it's just a move. Like, people are excited about a movie. They're yeah. excited to see other black people star in a movie in a sea of movies that are usually starred by all white people. All right. So, like, how do you not understand this is a good thing that they're excited about? Like, just let people enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. If you want to go see a, if if someone's excited about a movie, why do you have to come in and shit on them? Like, what's... What's the point? I don't so Yeah, and also in that, that sort of thing makes me question anything else that he says. Right. Because now because because that was that was also so incredibly disingenuous that how am I supposed to trust anything that that Shapiro says on on actual policy? Because I've seen that video now. So I don't know. Yeah, it seemed that he was also like setting up a straw man saying that he said that this was like the biggest thing for black people ever yeah, like, like i was more like, than martin luther king yeah. more than like, i was really shocked no, like, i was like what are you about? saying that made no sense whatsoever but yeah. um you know there's this whole now this kind of i would say almost right-wing fetish for debates now because ben shapiro will do these kinds of things you know would you ever be interested in doing debates like that um i'm not a debate guy i'm just gonna be honest i'm to me i'm more of a teacher i i I'm like a, a political whisperer. Like I, I try to speak politics to people who may not fully grasp certain things. Um, that's my role. I, I'm not. I'm not an ideologue. I. I don't. I don't. You know, prescribe to to uh, you know certain viewpoints. I, I, I. I'm a guy that there are policies I support, and I want to explain to you why I support whatever policy. That's what I do. So in terms of debating. I'm I'm sure Ben Shapiro is a better debater than me. He could probably kill me in a debate, but that doesn't mean he's right on the issues. Right. Yeah. So that's what this I this confusion is. If somebody wins a debate, it doesn't mean they're they're right on the issues. It means they're a better debater. Um, sometimes it means they also have they're also correct on the issues, but it could just mean they're they're really good at speaking in circles and getting you twisted. And that's not my thing. So. Uh, so you're Canadian now. I was wondering what your thoughts were on all the this kind of, I don't know. I guess. I don't know if there are that many, but there's definitely so a decent amount, I guess, of new media figures, conservative new media figures who are Canadian. I don't know if you know who Steven Crowder is and uh, Lauren Southern. Um, if you know who they are, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on them. I, I don't follow them at all. I, I, I know their names, but uh, the only thing I've seen of Steven Crowder was a disgusting video where he was trying to um undercut uh, uh immigrant laborers yeah. by like pulling up a truck and 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 like and yeah. he had like white people in there saying oh we'll do it for less 
and then he would br- and, and then at the end of the video he uh had like uh, i guess a bunch of immigrants in the back of his truck and then he he asked them all for papers and then they all yeah. jumped out like it's yeah that shit's gross yeah, it's gross right. like again this is not to me that's not entertainment that's disgusting mm-hmm. and for other people i don't know just uh, i don't understand how people can watch him um just based on that so i'll be honest i don't know him otherwise really but if you do something like that you are not a great person so here's something that's uh you know i guess kind of unrelated but it's pretty important something that divides jimmy Dore from a lot of other people is this russia you know whole scandal that some people call it and you know i was curious what your thoughts are specifically do you think there was collusion between the trump campaign and russia number one Number two, if you do believe that there was, do you think it affected the election in any way, shape, or form? Um, number one, no, I don't think there was collusion. Um, number two, I do think Russia tried to uh, mess things up. I do think they tried to, you know, pay for trolls and pay for propaganda to to try and, you know, whatever it is. That I, I think the whole, the whole, the whole. Uh, I guess purpose of of what the Russian government was trying to do was try to make a mess. I don't think they were really trying to get Trump elected. That's ultimately what happened. But I don't think that was really the purpose. It was to throw a wrench into the system. Um, that said, I don't think the Trump campaign worked with Russia. Um, so it's it's one of these stories where, like, aren't corporations, aren't the influence of corporations more important? than any of this like so it if if you think russia meddled in the election how about oil companies how about big pharma how about all these other industries with these massive corporations that are are influencing not just the presidential election but all the elections with their money by buying off these politicians so if you're angry about russia meddling you should also be at least equally angry about massive multinational corporations trying to influence elections because none of it is representing the actual people of the country. So that's where it, it, it comes down to for me. I don't understand why there's this big hoopla over the Russian government and not at least equal uh, anger over corporations or even other countries like like Saudi Arabia or whoever it is. Like there's there should be equal anger to go around. <laughs> so to just focus on Russia to me seems kind of odd. All right, David, thank you so much for coming on. It was a great interview. No problem. Anything else you'd like to say before uh, before it's over? Uh, just check out uh, my show at therationalnational.com. And if you want to become a Patreon uh, or patron, then go to uh, therationalnational.com slash join, and you'll get to the page. Yeah, make sure you guys subscribe to him. Thanks a lot for coming on, David. Really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me.